Welcome to the Badlands, that overlooked place where philosophical thought runs into the political concerns of the day. Welcome to the Badlands Politics and Philosophy Podcast, a series which aims to expose and examine the underlying ideas that shape our political landscape. I'm Toby Napolitano. And I'm Michael Hughes. In our last episode on economic inequality in the American dream, we argued that there are massive differences in access to opportunity between the rich and the poor, and that this is both a cause and an effect of economic inequality. So not only is the American dream a myth, since the dream relies on an idea of equality of opportunity, but economic inequality is itself a major barrier to justice. And all of this points in the direction of an argument we made in the first episode on inequality. Namely, that the extreme inequality that we see in the U.S. implicates our basic institutions, which determine the distribution of resources and opportunity. Frankly, the extreme inequalities in wealth and opportunity show that they are unjust and are in need of revision. Sound familiar? We haven't given any definition of what a progressive is, nor do we think it's very useful to do that. But one of the things that clearly sets progressives apart from most liberals and conservatives is that we tend to be far less accepting of our basic institutions and think that they stand in need of substantial revision. Right. And this is why, for instance, progressives tend to cringe at the idea of incremental change, an idea which is usually taken to typify the politics of the Democratic Party. It's also why the Democratic Party often criticizes progressives for being too radical and revisionary. The incremental change approach accepts our institutions as being basically just, but as needing some improvement, while the progressive sees them as being basically unjust, and so an urgent need of more radical revision. Appealing to the American dream is one way that people try to argue that, while extreme economic inequality might be unfortunate, it doesn't reflect any deep injustice. So long as the American dream is alive, the idea goes, things must be basically just. But as we've argued previously, there's really just no defense to be had of the American dream. And frankly, this should be abundantly obvious to anyone who has any familiarity whatsoever with the relevant statistics, or for anyone who, you know, thinks for a second about how opportunity is distributed in our society. But in this episode, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Since we don't think there's any way to defend the existence of the American dream, one can't appeal to it to justify the extreme economic inequality we find in the U.S. But... There is another defense one can make of the distribution of wealth and income in the U.S., and that is the meritocracy defense. Right. Someone might say, hang on a second. Even if there's massive inequality of opportunity, and even if not everyone has a fair shot, people are still getting, in a sense, what they deserve. After all, people who are wealthy do work hard for what they have and contribute to society. People who are poor, even if it's because they never had a real chance— do not work hard or contribute to society, and so shouldn't be rewarded. In other words, one could grant that there's great inequality of opportunity, and that this is an injustice, but argue that the current unequal distribution of wealth is still appropriate, because distribution of wealth should basically match the distribution of merit. And wealthy people, in part because of their access to opportunities, have more merit. Let's call this the meritocracy argument. It's an interesting kind of argument. If it were correct, then it might be tempting to think that not only is our current distribution of resources justified, but it also might mean that the kinds of reforms progressives would favor to deal with the problem of inequality of opportunity are morally unjustified. Right. For instance, progressives tend to argue that there needs to be much greater assistance given to poor families to ensure that poor kids get a fair shot at economic success. But that would mean substantially raising taxes on the wealthy, which means that it would require an effort to redistribute resources directly from the rich to the poor. That, in turn, would mean taking away resources from the rich that they earned and deserve. How can that be fair or just? Do you think because health care reform will eventually help everybody that everybody should have to sacrifice? In other words, if you, if you attach a surtax to people who are making 280000 or more, isn't that, in effect, punishing the rich? No, it's not punishing the rich. I think the way I look at it is, is that if I can... Uh, afford to do a little bit more so that a whole bunch of families out there have a little more security when I already have security. Uh, That's part of being a community. When people say that progressives want to solve inequality by punishing the rich, they probably have something like the meritocracy argument in mind. And while they might agree that we need greater equality of opportunity, 
They will say that we need to try to achieve that in a way that doesn't unfairly punish those who have succeeded, i.e. the rich. And maybe this is what politicians like Paul Ryan are thinking when they say the government should address inequality of opportunity, but not inequality of outcome. And it might also be what the Democratic Party is thinking when it pushes for incremental change. Just as an aside here, most people would tend to think of Paul Ryan and the Democratic Party as occupying completely different ends of the ideological spectrum. But like Ryan, the Democratic Party, since the Bill Clinton years, has been explicit that they oppose redistributionist policies, and that instead they favor pro-growth policies. The idea here is that they can ensure opportunity for all while benefiting everyone, and crucially, without taking from the rich what they've earned. Ryan's views and centrist Democrat views are pretty indistinguishable on this point. Of course, as we argued last time, it's hard to see how it's possible to address inequality of opportunity without pretty considerable efforts at redistribution, given that poverty itself is such a giant barrier to opportunity. If it's not possible, then plausibly it would be justifiable to suspend meritocracy for a time until we could establish a baseline of equality of opportunity. If that's right, then progressive programs would be justified. But all of this depends on the idea that the United States is a meritocracy, that the distribution of wealth mirrors the distribution of merit, or to put it another way, that people get what they deserve. And it also depends on the idea that the U.S. should be a meritocracy, that meritocracy is a good thing. First things first, though. Do we live in a meritocracy? Well, if we're going to talk about whether we live in a meritocracy or not, we're going to have to figure out what the hell we mean by merit. Ah, oh, shit. You mean we're actually going to have to do some philosophy? I'm afraid so. And it's not surprising. The idea of merit is actually pretty puzzling. We know that to have merit is to somehow be deserving of something, but that doesn't help much because then we have to ask what the hell it is to be deserving of something. Right. We talk about dessert in a variety of contexts. For instance, if we're eating out and the waitstaff provides a really great service, we might say that the server deserves a good tip. Or if they do a really bad job, they might deserve no tip at all. All right, only assholes don't tip at all. I actually like to talk about dessert in a restaurant before I get the check, but after the main course. I thought we agreed that there would be no dessert puns. Oh, I actually don't know how to make dessert puns. Do you have a recipe, Michael? Or, for example, if someone makes a series of really bad jokes, we might say that they deserve to be shunned. Eh, touché. We also talk about dessert in the context of competitions and criminal justice. We might say, for instance, that an athlete who broke the rules of the game but wasn't caught didn't deserve to win. Or that murderers deserve serious punishment. These all present interesting questions about what it is to deserve something. But our focus is on a particular kind of dessert, or merit. Namely, what is it to be deserving of the wealth that you have? And derivatively, what is merit in the context of possessing wealth? These are pretty tricky questions, and we don't intend to settle them completely here. However, we can at least refine the ideas of desert and merit a little in the context of the distribution of wealth. And we can also ask for various proposals of what it is to have merit, whether the U.S. is, in fact, a meritocracy, whether resources are distributed according to the distribution of merit. Right, and as we'll argue, the U.S. is not close to representing a meritocracy on any sensible understanding of what it is to be deserving of wealth. In fact, what we'll be arguing is that it's really puzzling why anyone would think that resources are distributed on the basis of merit. Plausibly, that's not even what our basic institutions aim at. We tell our young people how our country was carved out of the wilderness. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Our nation was not carved out of the wilderness. Our nation was hammered and hoed and chopped and dug and sawed and clawed out of the wilderness by barehanded men who asked nothing for nothing. America did not start out with an agricultural production that's the awe and envy of the world. It was seeded first by sod-busting farmers who fought Indians and ranchers and cold and heat and drought and bugs and flood and one another. The fruited plain sprang forth from barren acres only after they had been watered with a lot of sweat. But let's start thinking more about what it might be to be deserving of wealth. A common starting point is to think that it's about hard work, right? You deserve wealth to the extent that you apply yourself and work hard. 
You can see this idea as being partly embedded in statements of the American dream. Those statements typically begin with the qualifier, if you work hard. This is because we tend to think that you can only guarantee yourself a decent life if you work hard. And this often seems like a good idea to people precisely because they think that if you work hard, you deserve some baseline level of wealth. And if you don't, well, you don't deserve much at all. Okay, but there are two big problems here. First, the idea that working hard makes you deserving of wealth is overly simplistic. That's just not what merit is in the relevant sense. And second, even if that was what made you deserving of wealth, you'd have to be really, really misinformed, or maybe just very drunk, to think that the distribution of resources mirrors the distribution of hard work. And so there's no way to defend the current distribution of resources on those grounds. But let's take the first point first. Why does mere hard work by itself fail to ensure that someone is deserving of wealth? Well, there are some pretty obvious counterexamples. First, we typically think that what you deserve depends a lot on the result of one's work, not just how much they put into it. Some people, obviously, are much better at certain tasks than others. Right. For example, suppose, I don't know, Michael and I decide that uh, we want to win gold medals on the U.S. men's gymnastics team. We decide this despite knowing that we're way too old and, and, you know, like way too sucky at gymnastics to have any kind of gymnastics success at any level. And suppose we work harder at it than anyone ever has before. We train nonstop, pushing ourselves to the point of collapse, doing all sorts of gymnastic things. And then, after years of training, we still are, predictably, really sucky at gymnastics. Do we deserve any of the accolades or money that go along with being world-class gymnasts, despite the fact that we still suck? Do we deserve them more than the gold medal winners because we work the hardest? Most people would say, hell no. In fact, they might even think that they deserve some kind of payment from us for subjecting them to our pathetic gymnastics display. Personally, I think you're underestimating us. We could definitely make some sick fail videos. But, alright, we would probably be deserving of pity and not much else. Okay, so it's not just hard work that matters, but the result of one's work matters too. But it also depends on the kind of work you're engaged in. Some kinds of work, for example, are pretty damn useless, and some are downright harmful. Right. So, for instance, someone could work themselves to death in a quest to count all of the blades of grass on Earth. We probably wouldn't think this person, even if they were really good at it, should get a lot of money for their grass counting. The work they're doing is useless. Or consider a crime boss who works exceptionally hard to develop a lucrative business, a Tony Soprano type. They've put in a tremendous amount of time and energy in breaking legs and cracking skulls. They may be prolific workaholics, but we tend to think that they're not deserving of the wealth they accumulate, but instead of criminal punishment, uh, and that they should be forced to pay restitution. So all of this suggests that hard work alone does not make one deserving of wealth. Instead, it suggests that what matters is contributing something valuable to society, which hard work often leads to, though it doesn't always. Many people work really hard to extract value from society. So when someone defends the massive accumulation of wealth by the rich by saying that they deserve it because they worked hard for it, they're relying on a notion of desert that nobody accepts, including them. The justification, therefore, fails. But there's another point that needs to be raised here, even if we grant for the sake of argument that hard work makes one deserving of wealth. If one wants to defend the current distribution of resources, it's not enough to point to the idea that the rich work really hard. Even if they do, if it's going to be just for them to have so much more than poor people, you'd have to argue that not only do they work really hard, but that they work that much harder than poor people. At this point, things get pretty facepalm worthy. The argument we made in the last episode on inequality already suffices to make this point ridiculous. Poor kids can work just as hard or harder than rich kids, and they're likely to have far less to show for it because they simply don't have access to the same opportunities. Hard work doesn't mean much if you never get the opportunities you need to capitalize on it. But let's belabor the point a little bit, because it's worth talking a little more about hard work and the distribution of wealth in the U.S. I mean, for starters, many of the wealthiest people in the world are people who simply inherited their fortunes. And once someone acquires any significant amount of wealth, they can just pay someone to manage their investments and make more money than most of us can dream of. This does not require hard work in any reasonable sense of the term. Clearly, many people who are extremely wealthy do not work hard and don't need to. But of course, many wealthy people do work hard. 
The problem, obviously, is that poor people also do. Someone who works long hours on a farm or factory or both every week, for instance, is, by all reasonable standards, working hard. Likewise for a single mom who might have to work two or three jobs and still not have enough to support her family. And we should keep the nature of the work in mind, too. Some kinds of work are far more taxing than others. Some jobs, like being a coal miner or an assembly line worker, are physically crushing and break down workers' bodies and lead to serious health problems. Anyone who works these kinds of jobs is working really, really hard and are not getting all that much to show for it. And this doesn't just apply to so-called blue-collar jobs. Lots of white-collar and service sector work is extremely tedious, mentally taxing, and stressful. This kind of work can be extremely hard and will often pay very little. Meanwhile, the higher-ups of the company, or shareholders if there are any, will very often make much, much more. Now, they too might be working hard, but if they're making, say, ten times the amount of their average worker, it's probably not because they're working ten times harder. Now, some people here might be tempted to say, well... If the poor person would have worked harder in school, they wouldn't be poor. But as we argued last episode, that's just not true due to massive differences in opportunity. One has a better chance to be wealthy if they do poorly in school, but their family is wealthy, than if they do well in school, but their family is poor. And second, this response totally misses the point, since the question is whether wealthy people are wealthy because they work hard, not whether they worked hard in school as children. Also, it would be pretty monstrous to try to justify someone's poverty by pointing to failings they might have had as children. But that's another issue. And of course, some people who are poor don't work hard. In many cases, they can't. And sure, just as with the rich, in some cases, they don't want to. The point, though, is that no single income class has a monopoly on hard work or lack thereof. Wealth is not determined by work ethic. Okay, so one's hard work alone does not determine how deserving they are of wealth. Furthermore, it's just obviously wrong to think that differences in wealth are a function of differences in hard work. And one thing that should be obvious at this point is that the distribution of resources isn't just a function of differences in intelligence. As all of the data concerning the importance of family wealth shows, if your family is wealthy, intelligence is a bonus, but isn't necessary. But if your family is poor then intelligence doesn't mean much if you don't get any opportunities to capitalize on it. And just like work ethic, intelligence isn't a good basis for merit either. If it's not applied towards socially valuable ends, then we won't see someone as being deserving of much. Right. The criminal mastermind deserves, if anything, punishment. And someone who brilliantly finds ways to scam people out of their money, a Bernie Madoff type, even if they are operating within the law, we tend to think is not deserving of the wealth they accumulate. And let's be honest. There are a lot of dumbass rich people. If you need examples, try turning on the TV. Most channels will do. So, for the sake of the rest of this episode, let's think of being deserving of wealth as being a matter of contributing value to society. And by value here, we don't mean mere economic value, but moral value. In other words, the question is whether one actually improves the general well-being of society or not. And someone can say... Look, I know it's not fair that poor people don't get the same opportunities to contribute to society and so to develop merit, but the fact is that they have less merit by this metric, and so frankly, they deserve less. And that's why they have less. Right? If you have nothing, then there's not much you can contribute. Well, we already know there are plenty of exceptions here. There's lots of people who become really wealthy without contributing any value to society. The obvious cases, again, are people who simply inherit their wealth. And then there are folks who get wealthy by contributing something, but not all that much. For instance, a hedge fund manager might make lots of money padding the wallets and pocketbooks of the extremely wealthy. They're helping a handful of wealthy people get a bit wealthier, but if those wealthy people aren't doing any good with that money, then it's not adding much to society. Not to mention that there are people, for example, whose job it is to help insurance companies screw people over, or who are scam artists, or help design increasingly lethal weapons of war. Those people are possibly making us worse off by working hard and applying their skills. And then there's the other side of the coin. There are people performing really valuable work who get paid very little. In fact, it's an interesting exercise to think in the abstract about what kinds of work should be rewarded highly by a society, which kinds of work are most valuable and most deserving of reward. When I've asked students this question, they give pretty interesting answers. They say things like doctors, teachers, nurses, and police officers— 
things which they see as being essential for the well-being of a society. And then you know what other work they see as being highly valuable? Garbage collecting? Bingo. That is an extremely important job. If garbage collection doesn't happen, we are all fucked and fast. Right. And not only is it important, but like a lot of unskilled work, it can be highly unpleasant to do. And so if anything, you'd think that even higher compensation is warranted. And as we mentioned earlier, some important work is not only unpleasant, but risky. Certain jobs put people at risk of significant physical or mental harm. And yet most of these jobs are not paid particularly well at all, at least compared to lots of jobs which pay extremely well, yet are less risky, less unpleasant, and which contribute less to society. The stats on productivity and wages illustrate very vividly the fact that one's earnings are not simply a function of how much one contributes to society. Since the 70s, real wages, workers' hourly wages adjusted for inflation, have stagnated, while worker productivity has increased greatly. To be more precise, between 1973 and 2014, U.S. worker productivity rose by 72.2%, while the hourly wages of the medium worker adjusted for inflation rose only 8.7% over that period, while the hourly wages of the medium worker adjusted for inflation rose only 8.7% over that period. In short, the amount you receive from your labor isn't simply a function of how much you contribute. Over the past 40 years or so, the extra wealth generated by workers via their increase in productivity has mostly gone to executives and shareholders, hence the skyrocketing inequality that we've been discussing. The point we're making here is a really important one. Think about what this means for debates about increasing the minimum wage, for instance. Right. Workers, by being more productive, are contributing more than ever. If one thinks that people should be rewarded in accordance with their contributions, then when people fight for a higher minimum wage, they are fighting for what they are due. They are not asking for anything beyond what they deserve. The question should be why executives of massively profitable corporations find it acceptable to hoard the value of their employees' labor, as they have been to increasing degrees over the last 40 years. Maybe we should bemoan the fact that those executives think they should be given everything. Now, at this point, there are some people who will just say, look, life isn't fair, deal with it. And we would probably take up the deal with it approach to economic policy in future episodes. But for now, we will just note that that is exactly the point we're making. The economy is not fair, and it's not merit-based. So let's please give up the illusion that it is, and that it rewards those who deserve it. Life is unfair. There's nothing fair about one man being born blind and another man being born with sight. There's nothing fair about one man being born of a wealthy parent and one of an impecunious parent. There's nothing fair about Muhammad Ali having been born with a skill that enables him to make millions of dollars one night. What kind of a world would it be if everybody was an absolute identical duplicate of anybody else? You might as well destroy the whole world and just keep one specimen left for a museum. In the same way, it's unfair that Muhammad Ali should be a great fighter and should be able to earn millions. But wouldn't it, be, would it not be even more unfair to the people who like to watch him if you said that in the pursuit of some abstract ideal of equality, we're not going to let Muhammad Ali get more for one night's fight than the lowest man on the totem pole can get for a day's unskilled work on the docks? The fact that the wages that are attached to particular jobs is not a function of how much value they contribute to society really shouldn't be a surprise. That's just not how wages are fixed in a market economy like ours. Some jobs are essential and incredibly valuable for society, but are relatively unskilled, and so lots of people can perform them. If there's a huge labor pool for a job, then the wages will tend to be pushed down. This, of course, is just basic economics. Right. The, the most ardent defenders of markets don't do so on the grounds that they help to ensure that everyone gets what they deserve. Rather, they defend them on the grounds that markets maximize our freedom to enter into agreements with one another. Agreements to trade a certain amount of money for a consumer good or to sell our labor for a particular price. Whether markets always do that or not is another matter, but the point for now is that the idea of dessert doesn't enter into the picture at all. And not only do wages fail to reflect the value of particular kinds of work, but some kinds of really valuable work don't have a market value at all, including, I would argue, probably the most important work that the average person is likely to engage in, namely parenting, and especially good parenting. Right. Good parenting is another one of those things where, if you step back and think about a society in the abstract, 
you quickly conclude that it is of huge importance to the success of that society. And this is a point that feminists have long pointed out, that care work like parenting or caring for family members, which has largely been carried out by women, is severely undervalued in our society. Not only do people who do these kinds of work not get paid for it, or don't get paid all that much if they do that kind of work professionally, but the work is also culturally devalued in that it does not afford much in the way of status or respect. And worse, in the United States anyways, it's not just that you won't get paid for parenting work, but very likely you will make significant economic sacrifices. You will need to pay for supplies and possibly care for your child. You might have to take time away from work, forego career opportunities, or you might lose your job altogether. So not only does good parenting work not get valued by the market, but this really valuable work is actually punished in a sense. And we're not saying that people should get paid for parenting or even for good parenting. Child care might just not be the sort of thing that ought to be commodified. The point here is just that good parenting is highly valuable work. By definition, that means good parents accumulate merit in the sense that we're concerned with. They're deserving of some of the wealth of society. And yet, this is work that is unpaid and typically constitutes an economic sacrifice. Once again, markets do not distribute resources on the basis of merit, and so it is unsurprising that our current distribution of resources doesn't mirror the distribution of merit. There's another major objection that we have to raise to the meritocracy response, and that has to do with the importance of luck. Benefits one obtains are obstacles one faces for reasons that are completely beyond their control. What does luck have to do with merit and desert? Well, typically, we tend to think that to the extent that someone's success or failure is based on luck, they aren't deserving of reward or punishment. Right. For example, suppose that on your way to work, you encounter a starving man, and so to save his life, you offer him your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But unbeknownst to both you and him, he has recently developed a fatal peanut allergy. He eats the sandwich, and then he dies. In that case, what you did was actually noble. You couldn't have known what the outcome of his eating the sandwich would be, and so since the information was hidden from you, the outcome was beyond your control. You were just really, really unlucky, as was the starving man. Consequently, we don't think it would be appropriate to punish you or to treat you as a murderer. Or consider the opposite sort of case. Imagine an evil villain who, in an attempt to poison the population of some city, dumps some chemical into the water supply. All of his research suggested that the health consequences would be devastating for anyone who drank the water. The villain gets extremely lucky, but they're still a villain. And we don't think they're deserving of praise or any kind of reward. They just happen to be kind of bad at being a villain. Okay, so what does this have to do with the distribution of wealth and income in the United States? Well, it's convenient to think that people are really in charge of their economic destinies, and that differences between people's choices are what determine why they end up where they do. But as our discussion of inequality should be making clear by now, our economic outcomes are much more dependent on luck than most of us would prefer to admit. Right, so think about all the various factors that determine one's outcome and the distribution of resources more generally. As we've discussed previously, one major factor is the wealth of the family one is born into. In fact, that even goes a long way towards determining one's educational outcome. What family you are born into is, obviously, purely a matter of luck. Then, of course, there are facts about the economy that determine what kinds of work and skills are going to be valuable at a given time at a given location. This will depend on factors like the demand for certain kinds of work and the size of the available labor pool for that work. These, obviously, are things beyond your control. Right. Consider, for instance, how much more valuable it is today to be somewhat competent at certain kinds of mathematics or computer programming. If your natural talents incline you towards things like art and music and away from math or other more currently marketable skills, well, you're at a massive economic disadvantage. And even if you do get lucky enough to develop the kind of skills that the market values and get a decent paying job, for most people that can evaporate very easily due to various market forces or more idiosyncratic reasons like if the company wants to downsize or relocate overseas. None of this stuff is in your control either. And then there are other kinds of good and bad breaks. Suppose you get sick or you get in an accident and have huge medical bills. Medical problems, in fact, are one of the biggest causes of bankruptcy. Even if one is lucky enough to have the relevant insurance, people with serious injuries or illnesses typically have to miss work, sometimes for substantial periods. 
Now, what about the point that Michael Bloomberg is fond of making? Namely, economic success requires luck, but the more hardworking you are, the more opportunities you'll have to get lucky. What's your advice to these small business founders today? Uh, work hard. You're going to need some luck, but the harder you work, the luckier you get. Doesn't that mean that, provided you're smart and hardworking, you have some control over your economic destiny? Well, sure, you may have some ability to increase your odds of success, but as long as some people are going to end up unlucky, then they're not in control of their economic destiny, full stop anyway. But we also shouldn't overlook the deeper point that even things like intelligence and work ethic are arguably largely the result of genetics, good parenting, a stable environment, access to nutrition all of which are things that need to be lucked into. We could go on and on here, but the important point is just that, frankly, our life outcomes are shot through with luck. And a lot of people find this disconcerting. It's very important to them that they deserve what they have and that they are responsible for their own success. Yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon, but an unfortunate one, since it often stands in the way of gaining support for institutional change, since people emphasize personal responsibility and minimize the influence of external factors in explaining people's outcomes. Okay, so here's what I think is actually a really interesting question. Do I deserve what I have? I definitely don't. I mean, I lead a pretty simple lifestyle, and I don't have all that much. But I do live comfortably enough. So do I deserve it? I actually find that to be a really difficult question to answer. However, one thing I am pretty confident about is that there are people who are more deserving who have less than I do. Statistically speaking, and this will hold for practically everyone who is fairly well-to-do, it seems overwhelmingly likely that there are people who are smarter, more talented, more hardworking, who contribute more to society, and who are just plain better than me, who, for reasons of sheer bad luck, are having a much harder time getting by. Right. One doesn't have to go much farther than engaging in that thought exercise to come to the conclusion that our distribution of resources is not a function of what people deserve. But it's not hard to see why people avoid coming to that conclusion and downplay the importance of luck in their outcomes. Namely, to acknowledge the importance of luck is to concede that one isn't more deserving of what they have than everyone else. And then, once that concession is made, well, it becomes much harder to justify the fact that one lives a very comfortable or extravagant lifestyle while other people are struggling to get by. In that case, one can no longer appeal to the idea of meritocracy to justify the status quo, and to oppose proposals that would alleviate economic inequality by doing things like raising taxes on those who are well off to fund whatever programs might be necessary to raise people out of poverty. More must be done to reduce poverty and dependency, and believe me, nothing is more important than welfare reform. It's now common knowledge that our welfare system has itself become a poverty trap a creator and reinforcer of dependency. The day the Congress will vote on legislation to transform a broken system that traps too many people in a cycle of dependence to one that emphasizes work and independence. We must lift this counterproductive exemption and thereby get early help for these women and their children before they become chronically dependent on welfare. Today we have an historic opportunity to make welfare what it was meant to be. A second chance, not a way of life. It's to give people on welfare a chance to draw a paycheck, not a welfare check. Okay, so we've been arguing that the United States does not remotely resemble a meritocracy, and so one cannot defend the current distribution of resources by arguing that the wealthy deserve what they have, and so it would be wrong to try to institute policies which redistribute some wealth from the rich to the poor. But even if we grant that lots of rich people do deserve what they have though plenty don't, at minimum, there are plenty of people who are no less deserving. And so, appealing to meritocracy won't help in defending our radically unequal distribution of resources. But let's return once again to the idea of the American dream and examine it and the idea of meritocracy a bit more deeply. Because throughout these episodes, we've been arguing that the American dream is a myth. There's no such thing. And consequently, people shouldn't believe that it does exist. However, we've left open a more fundamental question— should it exist? Is it a good ideal to strive for? We've sort of been taking for granted thus far that it is a good ideal, that it would be good to live in a society which embodied the principles that underlie the American dream. Okay, so what are the underlying principles of the American dream that make it seem like a good ideal to organize our society around? Well, one of the underlying principles is just that if you work hard and contribute, 
then you should be able to make a decent life for yourself. And this principle seems basically right. It would seem like a fundamental moral failure of an economy if those who contribute can't even eke out a decent life for themselves and their families. But as we've noted, the American dream often involves a second implicit principle, namely that things should be basically merit-based. So it's not just the case that if you contribute, you should be rewarded, but if you don't contribute, then you should not be rewarded. In other words, the idea is that since this is the land of opportunity and the American dream is a reality, if you don't make it, economically speaking, this is your own fault. And so you don't deserve anything. And if you don't deserve to have anything, the thought continues, then it's not a problem if you don't have anything. In fact, it might even be good that you don't have anything. This is one of the consequences of thinking that the distribution of resources should be purely merit-based. And this is, once again, how the ideas of the American dream can be used to undermine the provision of social safety nets and other crucial public services. But this is where we need to challenge the idea that a purely merit-based system is desirable. Even if it is, in some sense, fair, though that's highly contestable, would it be a good system to have? Should we want to live in that kind of society? In general, we do want to reward those who contribute to society and to discourage people from simply depending on everyone else, but that can't be our only guiding principle. Or at least, that's what we want to argue now. I feel like this point is so important because, I swear, if there's anything Americans absolutely despise, it's free riders. Those people who are, you know, just leeching off the system, sucking up all of our tax dollars through welfare benefits without contributing a damn thing to society. Americans hate that. They sure do. And so they often develop this attitude that people who don't contribute should essentially be punished. Or at least we shouldn't enable their lifestyle, which results in the government stealing away our hard-earned money in the form of higher taxes. But let's slow down for a second. Is it true that people who don't contribute to society shouldn't get anything back from society? If you're going to take this question seriously, you have to consider who the people are who don't contribute to society. Because for a lot of people who don't contribute, they simply can't. Right. For example, some people, because of severe physical or mental disability, simply won't have the ability to contribute much. The same will sometimes be true of the very elderly. And lots of people will have the physical and mental ability to contribute in a variety of ways, but will lack the practical ability to do so, because they don't actually have access to employment. This might be either because our economy simply doesn't value their particular skills, or because they simply lack access to the relevant employment opportunities, perhaps because those opportunities simply don't exist where they live. This is not an uncommon phenomenon in the United States. As is pretty well known now, there are areas in the U.S. that depended on the existence of decent manufacturing jobs which have largely disappeared, leaving a substantial, unemployed, and unemployable population, given that they lack the skills that are currently valued in the market. For those that lack the ability to move where the jobs are, even if they have the relevant skills, they will lack the practical ability to contribute to society in the usual ways, and will be dependent on government assistance. We should also keep in mind that it's not the case that everyone who is poor and depends on government assistance lacks a job. For lots of people, they will only be able to access part-time jobs which pay minimum wage and offer no benefits. Those kinds of people, too, often need to depend on government assistance. And there's one major group that we haven't mentioned yet that doesn't contribute to society, and which demonstrates how extreme a purely merit-based distribution would be. And that is children. Those damn moochers. Right. We actually legally forbid them to have most jobs, and yet we spend huge sums of money to make sure that they have shelter, have enough to eat, that they get an education, until they go to college, of course, and so on. And we don't just spend this money as parents, but with our tax dollars, in the form of various public services, like public schools and welfare programs, when their parents can't adequately provide for them. And why do we do that? Well, in part, because it would be completely morally monstrous if we didn't do those things. Likewise, it would be monstrous not to make sure that generally those who can't contribute for whatever reason can still lead a decent life and don't have to be forced into poverty. Here, one could appeal to human rights principles or the importance of respecting human dignity. But hopefully, our basic sense of human decency is enough to convince us that those who fail to contribute because they can't still should be able to live decent lives. The situation might be complicated, of course, if there just weren't enough resources to go around for everyone. If that were the case, then we would have very difficult choices to make about which groups ought to make sacrifices. 
though it's not at all obvious to us that those who can't contribute should be forced to make the greatest sacrifices. You might think, for instance, that those who can best bear the sacrifices ought to. But really, that issue is besides the point, since there are enough resources to go around. As we argued in an earlier episode, one of the problems of our current unequal distribution of wealth is not just that there is poverty, but that, at the same time, there is an extraordinary amount of wealth. But let's be honest here. When Americans say that if you don't contribute, you don't deserve anything, they're not thinking of those people who can't contribute. They're thinking about those who can, but choose not to. That's right. Though there's definitely a tendency to incorrectly assume that most people who don't contribute simply choose not to. But anyways, let's consider the more difficult question. Should people who don't contribute, but can do so, the real free riders? be insured a decent life through various government assistance programs, assuming there are enough resources to reasonably do so. Ah, now we're getting to the good shit. That's right. Now we're going to defend the deadbeats. Now, I know that lots of people here will say, absolutely not, screw those free riders. But to me, this is one of those deep questions where we need to ask, what kind of people are we and what kind of people do we want to be? Do we care more about making sure people are punished or do we care about preventing avoidable suffering? My own view is that if there's enough to go around, I'd rather not have people starve, even if the reason they're starving is because they just don't feel like working. But then, the reply one often hears is that if you have programs in place that ensure people will lead decent, though certainly not lavish lives, then nobody will work because they don't have to. And then, the whole economy comes crashing down, or something like that. A couple of quick points here. First, most people are motivated to live lives that go well above a life which just has all of the basic necessities but not much more, which is what we're talking about here. Second, and this one drives me nuts, the reply is based on incredibly far-reaching psychological and sociological generalizations which no one has any evidence for. We don't just get to make up ideas about what people will do in those situations and what the consequences would be for the society at large. And there's also the issue that, in practice... The more you try to make sure that people who don't deserve government assistance aren't getting it, the more difficult you make it for those who do need it. And then you have to ask yourself whether punishing the free riders is so important that it's worth the cost of having some people who do need it not getting it. And even supposing some people worked less and the economy as a whole became less efficient, the thing one has to ask themselves is whether that extra efficiency is so important that we have to hang the threat of crushing poverty over everyone's head especially if one's only available employment is some soul-sucking or physically destructive job that no human should want to do. At this point, we're getting to much larger topics that will probably be the focus of future episodes. The point for now is that it's just not true that we should have a purely merit-based distribution of resources. Right, and we're not saying that merit isn't relevant to a just distribution of resources. We think there are very legitimate criticisms to make of the current distribution because it does such a poor job rewarding those who deserve it. What we're saying is that even if a largely merit-based distribution of resources was fair and good, to be morally acceptable, the distribution should have adequate baselines, so that even those who don't contribute at all, for whatever reason, should be able to lead decent lives, provided we have the resources to make that happen. And, of course, we do. Bringing this back to the idea of the American dream, we think it's important to point out it's only half right. On the one hand, it clearly should be the case that someone who works hard and contributes to society should be able to make a decent life for themselves. On the other, if the American dream involves the idea that one should only lead a decent life if they contribute, well, then there are better ideals to aspire to. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Badlands Politics and Philosophy Podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can help it grow by subscribing and by giving it a good rating or a review. And don't forget to check out our website, badlandsphilosophy.com where you can find a list of citations for every episode and access written content that we post there regularly. If you want to get in touch with us, you can do that through our website, and you can also find us on Twitter at at the Badlands Pod. Thanks again for listening.